Good evening, everyone. Merry Christmas Eve. It's so good to be with you. Um, as Ben said, I am Pastor Sarah, uh, Pastor of Outreach here at Mosaic Church, and it's just lovely to spend this holiday with you. Um, I know that the, the candle lighting specifically is just such a important tradition, and it's such a lovely tradition, so I'm excited for that uh, here coming up. Um, if you're joining us online, we're so glad that you're here. We're hoping that you're cozy, that you're healthy, um, that, we, that all of us can stay healthy. Oh my goodness, this is this year, everybody has been getting something, so if our immune systems were a little bit uh, lenient with us or, or lax the last couple of years, then um, we're definitely getting them pumped back up with all the things that are going around, so yay for that, I guess. Um, so anyway, we're just glad that you're here, however you are here. Um, and, you know, I, I hear a lot of people say, and, and I, you know, we hear that song all the time, like Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. Uh, you know, that is an actual uh, very common song that we like to sing. And in many ways it is. I think one of my favorite things is, um, you know, shopping for my kids, getting something very specific. They ask for things. And there, they well. There's this like wonder and mystery, um, you know, Santa Claus, and wondering when uh, the gifts are gonna, you know, arrive. And then the countdown, you know, um, the counting down the days with your. Maybe you have one of those like advent calendars that has the chocolate inside. That would never last at our house. Or we just have magnets because that chocolate would be toast. Um, you know, it would just be like the first day it gets out, then the kids would rate it. Right? Let's let's be honest. Um, but I'm, I'm so excited for tomorrow morning when the kids are opening up their gifts and they're going to be, they're, I think they're going to be excited. So we'll see. You guys can report back. Um, it's good to be with the people that we love. It's good to like take a trip and travel or maybe uh, your family's coming to visit you. I've met some uh, extended family members here tonight, just people who are visiting. And so it's so good to have you here with us. Um, I love eggnog, which you can only get this time of year. Who's an eggnog fan? Is there, there's a few. I've got my kids on board. I'm super excited about that, except that now I have to share. Not happy about that part. Um, and I love teaching my kids silly Christmas songs. Uh, one of my favorite ones that my youngest is into right now is Mele Kaliki Maka. Yes. Okay. So fun to sing. Um, and so there's so many wonderful things about this time of year that we really love. Um, and so it is easy to say Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. And yet it's kind of not completely the most wonderful time of year. There, there's something that's going on inside of us at this time that is really, really hard. If we're honest with ourselves, Christmas forces us to stare into a paradox. And the paradox is that when we're trying to celebrate and things are glittery and shiny and, and cozy at the same time, in the grand scheme of things, all is not well, all is not calm, all is not bright right? In our lives. On the macro level, we have worldwide problems. We have war. We have threats of war. We have this pandemic that we're trying to figure out how to navigate. We have rampant inflation. We have climate change. And closer to home, we have death and loss and grief. We have broken relationships. We have scary diagnoses. We have kids who are having a hard time adjusting to school. We have our lives that are going on. And every year, there, doesn't it feel like you're holding this incredible tension at Christmas time that you like want to be happy and you want to celebrate, but at the same time, it can feel kind of disingenuous because it's like your life isn't pausing, right? You still have to deal with all of the uncertainties and all of the sadness and all of the pain and all of the stuff that feels like it's looming in the future. It's all still there. It's not going on pause. And yet here we are, we're trying to to take a moment to celebrate and be together. And so it, even though we say it's the most wonderful time of the year, it does feel a little bit like we're ignoring some of the things that are going on or that we're being asked to ignore it. That maybe Christmas is just like, okay, just pretend that those things aren't going on. And that's what the Christmas holiday is about. But the good news of Christmas, the reason that Christmas is good news, is not because it's about finally solving all of our worldwide challenges or our personal problems. It's not about having a year where nothing goes wrong, where at the end of 2022, you go, oh my gosh, I got everything I wanted. Now I can celebrate. That's not what Christmas is about. Christmas is, is not good news because all of our problems are gone. Christmas is good news because Jesus was willing to, to choose to walk right into that mess of unresolve. 
right into the problem, right into the thing that has not been solved. He wasn't intimidated by the violence and all of the hardship and pain, the problems of our world. In fact, he, <laughs> this is what's so crazy. Like, I, re, I know for, for many of us, when we think about, like, stepping into something that's really hard or scary, it feels like we want to get bubble wrapped. We want to put our shields up when we're, you know, when you're going into, like, um, a hard business meeting or you're, you're going to, you know, meet someone, for, like an old friend or a family member you haven't seen in a long time, you kind of figure out, like, how to, to put your emotional shield up. You know what I'm talking about? You're like, you're like okay, how am I going to talk to this person so I can get the least hurt, right? How can I get through this holiday without talking to this person who's been really terrible to me? Or maybe I can just avoid going there in the first place. How can I put my shield up? And here's Jesus. He, it, he, he might be crazy. He comes to earth as a baby. You literally cannot get more vulnerable than that because anyone can pick him up. Anyone can just walk away with baby God. What the heck? What is he thinking, right? So he comes to us in a way that we would not expect. And there was a prophecy about Jesus. There was many, many prophecies that told us that he was coming. Um, the one I want to reference here is from the ninth chapter of Isaiah. Here the prophet, by the same name, is telling the Israeli people what to expect, that into their battle-worn lives is going to become come the Savior and he's going to come in a way that they aren't anticipating. So just read with me from Isaiah 9. He says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. You rejoice, they rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat... This is when the tiny little Israelite army of 300 defeated hundreds of thousands of bad guys who were taking all their stuff, okay? As in the day of the underdog defeat of Midian, you shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Doesn't this sound like an inspirational battle cry? right? For everyone who's downrange, keep going, keep fighting, right? And yet, the prophet Isaiah is about to flip the script. Here's what he says next. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. So the answer to the garment rolled in blood destined for burning is a child. Let's keep reading. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Remember that part. He will reign on David's throne over his kingdom, establishing it and holding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So let's just get this straight. God's answer to every warrior's boot used in battle, every garment rolled in blood will be fewer than for the fire is a baby. Cool. Thanks, God. What is the baby going to do? How is the baby going to help us? The baby can't change their own diaper or hold up their own head. How is this baby going to be the resolution to all this military conflict? How's the baby going to run a country? This is a weird solution. And even after Isaiah says this, do you want to know what happens? Nothing for 700 years. Do you guys know what was happening 700 years ago? 700 years. 700 years ago was the Black Death, the Black Plague, okay? The Ottoman Empire, the Ming Dynasty. There was no printing press. 700 years, you guys, nothing. That is a very, very untimely birth announcement, right? Usually if you're, like, announcing the birth, you're, it's like a few months maybe, or it already happened. This, you have to wait a very, very long time. So long, in fact, that the Israelite people, many of them forgot the details about this baby. And so when the angel Gabriel shows up to Mary in Luke 1, she doesn't remember. He references Isaiah 9, and she has no clue. Gabriel says to Mary, you will conceive and give birth to a son. Remember that. You are to call him Jesus. He will be called great. He will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Are you guys 
Remembering some of that from Isaiah 9, he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. He's using a lot of the same language from Isaiah 9, and Mary's just like, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. She has no clue. She doesn't remember. And like Mary and like Israel, when God promises something, sometimes it feels like it is just never going to happen. Sometimes we're holding out hope for things in our lives, and we forget what we're hoping for. Have you ever, like, hoped for something and then you just forgot because it was just taking so darn long? Okay. <laughs> says, says the 12-year-old. Um, sometimes I, like, forget. I'm like, oh, yeah, I wanted that to happen. And it happens. You're like, golly, takes forever. 700 years is even longer. And sometimes it just feels like our lives are so bleak and so hopeless that we're bombed out figuratively or literally. And as we're looking to God for hope, he's not giving us what we would expect. He's not implementing a new military strategy or a governmental coup or getting rid of capitalism or implementing capitalism. He's not descending out of heaven as this fully formed warrior deity here to overthrow the government. He's coming as a baby. He's a eight pound, six ounce, squishy, tiny baby. And he is going to be, apparently, the resolution for our military conflicts, our squabbles about finances, the trolls on Twitter. And so two things strike me about this, the audacity of this 700-year-in-the-making prophecy, that for, for those of us who've heard this story before, this might feel like old news. And I just I want to challenge you to see it with fresh eyes. If you haven't heard this story before or it's been a while, just tune in a little bit because this really, this is the story. This is the, the tradition of Christmas, but it really is so, so audacious. So one thing that stands out to me, the first thing, is that God's solution to the pain in our world is not all these things that we would think, right? When we think about how am I going to solve my problems, we're thinking about, okay, we need to vote in these leaders. We need to do these things with our finances. We need to do these things at the macro and micro levels in order to get the change that we want to see. And God's solution is not all of those things. His solution is this very, very intimate, very vulnerable entrance into the human condition, and at Christmas time, again, it's, the, it's very tempting to just kind of like spread this like thin veneer of happiness over the mess and be like, we're happy today, right? With that like fake high-pitched voice. Everything's great, right? You guys have seen that meme where the dog's in the house and everything's on fire. And he's like, it's fine. It's fine. Sometimes we ha- have that approach to Christmas where we're like, it's fine. And we're just trying to ignore what's going on. And so... I think that if we, if we get stuck thinking that Christmas is this, like, glittery, gift-giving, temporary denial of reality, we are missing the entire point. Because Jesus becoming, here's God as a baby, and that's such a radical thing. Because what that means is that he's no longer just this, like, shiny spirit guy in the sky who's only here for the God stuff and the holy stuff, Right? Now, God is saying, I refuse to remain far away. I refuse to remain undefiled and without dirt underneath my fingernails. God is coming down to us and entering into our condition, into addiction, broken relationships, into celebration and success, into all of the moments, into your last minute trip to Walgreens after the Christmas Eve service because you have to pick up those prints for Christmas gifts. Or is that just me? right? He is the God of all of those moments and all of those things that are going on. He's with us. He's never going to leave us or forsake us. He's not too busy. He's not too far off. I hear a lot of people say, my problem isn't that big. I don't want to bother God. Are you, maybe you're not thinking of God as, as big as he is. Maybe you're forgetting that Jesus as a baby means that God is literally in every single tiny detail of our lives, right? That's what that means, He is in every moment, and he knows what he's getting himself into with your life. It is not too messy. It does not intimidate him. He knows exactly what he's getting into. The second thing that I notice about God coming as a baby is simply that that confers so much value on human life. There were a lot of babies born this year, and it was so much fun to see. And every single one of those babies was so valuable. Here in our church especially, It's so fun to see these babies being born. 
And God's choice to come as a baby says that every human life is significant, that these babies are so important to our world. Because here's the deal. Even when this baby's born and this prophecy is being fulfilled, right? You remember how the angels, the, the, the shepherds are in the field, the angels come and they're like, it's the Savior, the Messiah. And they're like, awesome. And they go and they see him and they're like, okay, so like, what is he, he going to do something, right? Maybe some of you had, um, ha- have an older child. I remember when my second child was born and my three-year-old's like, Okay, so I have a little brother now. Like, when does he do stuff? He just lays there like he does nothing, right? Here's Jesus. He's supposed to be the savior of the world, and he's literally not doing anything. So now we have to wait again for 15 or 20 years. It takes that much time for, in our minds, for a a baby to grow up and do something that we see as significant. And yet that, if Jesus did that, and that was God's solution, for our human condition, then that means that every single baby who is born has value, has, has value because they, that's how God showed up in the world. Every baby is a radical sign of hope. And one of the most audacious things that we can do as people is to birth a baby or raise a baby or teach a baby or invest in the future when it feels like the world is hopeless, when it feels like things are really dark, it's easy to be like, oh, you know, not not think about the the future generations. But babies are so important. They they are that sign of hope because Jesus showed up in that way. And so it was God's plan to bring about this change and this healing and transformation in our world through the very, very slow work of being human. He did not do it through a radical and sudden governmental overthrow. He did it through this very slow process of learning how to walk and learning how to talk and learning a skill and a trade and teaching other people about it. It was a very, very slow thing. And so when we're sometimes wanting to like, we want to be like freed from our human condition. We want things to just shift really quickly. We want our circumstances to get better. We, that's how we, we're going to know that God's caring for us. Is if he'll just like, you deliver me or, or pull me out of this crappy situation that I'm in. And what if the real deliverance is that instead of just being yanked out of this thing or being bubble wrapped so that it doesn't have to like touch you, maybe the most miraculous part is that God who doesn't have to opt in to the human condition did. And he's coming down into your space and into your situation and he's not afraid and he's going to be with you and he's going to help you be transformed by that. He's going to enter the DNA and the dirt and the disappointment of our human experience along with us. And so because God decided to intervene as not a military leader or not some celebrity, but as a baby, that is proof that our humanity is powerful. Our humanity is what allows us to enter into the brokenness and the pain of other people. Right? That's what, that was Jesus' process. He came in a vulnerable state to, to be one with us and to earn our trust and win us over. And that process allowed us to trust him and allowed him to bring healing into our condition. Right? It wasn't being superimposed on us. It came up from within. And that is now our mission. We come up into our communities and into our schools and into our workplaces and nobody saw us coming because we're just a regular person. You're just a regular person and that's what's so amazing about you is that you are going to sneak up on the world with your kindness and your compassion and the fact that you're walking around with Emmanuel, God with us, with you. That, those are your superpowers, is your humanity and God with you. So, This year, if you're tempted to just kind of like, you know, water down or write off Christmas in some way, this is not like, let's make Santa's sleigh fly, Christmas cheer, closing here, okay? This is, I just want us to remember, like, what is this really, really about, okay? If you're tempted to write it off, if it seems easier to just say, you know what, there really isn't a lot to celebrate, to be cynical, it's easy to be cynical, It doesn't take any energy. We might say that our world is too far gone, but Jesus entered into our mess with vulnerability. And he continues to take that approach. It's not, he's, yes, he's in heaven right now. 
it says seated at the right hand of God. It doesn't mean that he's now no longer doing this. It means that he said, do what I did, right? Enter into the brokenness and humanity of others with your vulnerability and with your guard down to a degree, right? Bring me into all these different scenarios. He is our Emmanuel forever. This is what we can take away from this. God is our, God is with us forever. He will never leave us. It is not our strength. It's not our, it, it's, it's not our, the ways that we're impressive, but it's our vulnerability and our humanity that qualifies us to bring healing to other people. And finally, we can do great good and bring great healing into the world as we walk in the world with Emmanuel. It's not all up to you. It's not all, you don't have, when you say, I'm bringing my vulnerability, I'm bringing you my humanity, that means I just yelled at someone, right? I didn't, I didn't control myself. I didn't do a very good job of bringing in my humanity. God, you're bringing God with you, right? You don't have to do anything by yourself, but your humanity and God with you, that's your superpower. So I want you to take this away from today, that the world's pain is not too big for God, and that means that's not too big for you either. It's not too big for me. We were born into the world for such a time as this, each of us. It's our humanity and Jesus' presence with us that qualifies to be and qualifies us to be and bring restoration and hope to the world. The very restoration and hope that we seek, we are called to bring. So our worship team is going to come on up. We're going to close out here. We're going to prepare for our candle lighting. If you do not yet have a candle, we would love you to participate. The candles are just outside either door, if you don't have one yet. Okay. And we have our candle lighters who are going to be coming down the aisles. So those of you who are on the aisles, get ready to pass your light on to someone next to you. Okay. And if you would, join me in praying as we get started here. Lord, thank you so much for being Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you that you are the one who never leaves and never forsakes us. We thank you that you have accompanied us through every moment of our lives, whether we're aware of you or not. And so, God, we just ask that you would open our eyes so that we can see you in the mundane, in the tiny things, in the places where we've written you off. We can see how deeply you care for us because you've come to us in these places of of vulnerability and humanity. And God, I ask that you would also equip and empower each of us to bring that vulnerability into our own lives and to see it as an asset, to see it as a strength, to see it as something that the world needs. We welcome you into our lives afresh today. In Jesus' name. This teaching was recorded by Mosaic Church in Manhattan, Kansas, where we're uniting people in the way of Jesus. For more resources like this, visit mosaicmhk.com.